Uh, dear friends, thank you so much for turning up in such wonderful numbers to this event. Uh, it's really a very special occasion. Uh, I, I must confess that I, I both represent BIC, uh, since I'm on the program committee, as well as the Deccan Heritage Foundation here. But today I speak on behalf of the Deccan Heritage Foundation. It's my great honor to welcome you all tonight to this launch of our Deccan Heritage Foundation Mysore Sri Rangapatna Guide. Uh, and uh, as always, our grateful thanks to the Bangalore International Center. As many of you know, our mission is to preserve, restore, and promote the rich architectural heritage of the Deccan region of India by bringing together uh, specialists, communities, and patrons to undertake conservation and education programs central to our approach is keeping the, uh, the values of local entrepreneurial committee, community ownership and the environment at the forefront. Uh, founded by our architectural historians uh, and trustees uh, of the DHF UK, uh, Helen Fillon, George Michel, uh, and with Stefan Bloch-Saloz as co-founder, we work to restore, maintain, and inform the public about the Deccan's heritage, particularly its built heritage. Since our founding in 2011, we began in the UK with the founding of the original DHF UK. Uh, also then opened very shortly thereafter our India offices and set up our board here. And uh, we now have a US friends of the DHF. And you'll be happy to know that uh, not only do we have George Michel, our distinguished speaker here today, but we have Helen Fillon, Stefan Blavblok Salos, and Elena from our US friends of the USA, friends of DHF, all here with us today. So it's a very special occasion. <laughs> Uh, we have already executed several projects in the Deccan, uh, which include restoration of the Gagan Mahal in Anagundi, just outside Hampi, where we have actually been able to, um, uh, you know, really restore a, a very beautiful monument, which I hope all of you will go and see the next time you're in Hampi. We've restored the model of the residency in Hyderabad. Uh, the British Residency. Uh, the, we've restored the Khwaja uh, Bande Nawaz Darga in uh, Gulbarga. The, we've restored the Kare's water system of uh, uh, Bidar, which brings clean agricultural water to several families in that area. Uh, we have a conservation plan for temples in Ganpur in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and we have uh, the uh, the restoration of a British cemetery, and we have a solid waste management uh, project in Bidar. Ongoing projects include step wells at Osmania and restoration of three water systems, uh, restoration of the Rang Mahal Palace and Gardens in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, we have a documentation and archival center which we are building up and we want to complete the archaeological atlas for Hampi. Uh, Jay Lakshmi Vilas Mansion is perhaps at the moment the jewel in the crown, if I may use that term. Uh, we are, uh, thanks to two of our very generous donors, Harish and Bina Shah Foundation, as well as the US Ambassador's Cultural Fund, we are now in a position to undertake the entire restoration of this beautiful mansion and to create a world-class center for not just a museum, but a center of museology and training, which we hope Mysore will be proud of and Karnataka will be proud of. So uh, with that, let me turn you over to uh, my dear friend uh, Vikramajit uh, Ram, who is going to introduce George. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am absolutely delighted to be invited by the Deccan Heritage Foundation to do this introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Reddy and Dr. Filon. George Michel is an architectural historian specializing in India. He's worked extensively in the Deccan region, beginning some 50 years ago with his doctoral thesis on the early Chalukya temples of Badami. George obtained his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. For more than 20 years, from 1981, George and his fellow historian and partner, Dr. John M. Fritz, spent each winter se season in Hampi supervising the Vijayanagara research project. This was an international team of scholars in different disciplines engaged in studying the urban layouts and architecture of Hampi. Among George's collaborative publications with John is one of DHS's very early and very popular guidebooks, Hampi Vijayanagara, which many of us have a copy of, and if we don't, we ought to. George must also be acknowledged for bringing to light the earliest and probably the most comprehensive photographic documentations of Hampi made in 1850 by the British military officer Alexander Greenlaw. The extraordinary story of these images and their photographer is told in Vijayanagara Splendor in Ruins, which George edited and which was published in 2008. His bibliography comprises close to 50 books and counting to include academic works as well as large format full color volumes. Among these is the sumptuous Royal Palaces of India, a different book on the spectacular gardens and architecture of Mughal India, and most recently the profusely illustrated temples of Deccan India, Hindu and Jain. On a slightly more personal note, a certain very well-thumbed copy of your Penguin Guide to the Monuments of India, Volume 1, has been a fond and trusted traveling companion and source of inspiration. And for this, I will always be grateful. George will presently guide us on a tour of the built legacy of the Wadiyars of Mysore and of Tipu Sultan in Sri Rangpatna. He's happy to take our questions at the close of his talk. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. George Mitchell. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Vikramjit, for this comprehensive introduction. And tonight, my task is to um, excite you, make you aware of the legacy, the architectural legacy of the royal city of Mysuru and the great fort at Chirangapatna. I assume many of you have been there, some of you may come from there, but like any urban setting where people live, there's an amazing amount of architecture that you walk past and you don't notice. And I always tell the story of the famous German poet, Johann Goethe. At the end of the 18th century, he found himself in one of the great cathedral cities of Europe in Strasbourg. And he walked past this enormous Gothic cathedral that nobody had ever noticed since the 12th century. And he wrote about it, and suddenly people started to look at it. I mean, they had seen it going to church, of course, but they'd not noticed it. And this was one of the factors that led to what we call the Gothic Revival, the new appreciation of Gothic architecture. So one of the purposes of our guidebooks is to execute this task. We're not saying you don't know about it, but have you actually noticed it? And so this is going to be like a sort of preview of some of the architectural legacies and wonders of Mysuru. So we start with, now let me see if I get the technology here, with something that you will not see not because you don't have eyes, because it burnt and it's not there anymore. This is the old palace of Mysore. The Mysore palace that was built after 1799, when Tipu was killed and the Wadiyas returned to rule from Mysore. And they built this magnificent wooden palace with a great sort of audience hall where they could watch the Dasra festivals. And notice the architecture with the very lofty wooden columns. 
a feature of South Indian royal architecture. And so dominant was this image of what a palace looked like that it even turned up in mural paintings. Here we have a scene from the Krishna story, Krishna pulling down the wicked king Kamsa. It's from a 19th century mural in one of the temples inside the palace compound. So even though um, we know that Krishna was not uh, in, a, in a Mysore palace, but the artist put him there. So there you go. In 1897, the front of the palace burnt down and the um, ruling person was the widow of Chamaraja X. She was Vani Vilasa Sanidana, and she was the regent for seven years, and she must have been a very capable woman because she immediately got in touch with the leading, one of the leading British architects at the time, um, Henry Irwin, who had done projects for the Viceroy, and commissioned this very un-English Indo-Saracenic palace with its fantastic domes and its wonderful tower you can see at the top there. So this was the palace from the early part of the 20th century. And today, just about the only part you can see is the tower itself. That's the only part that is really visible. This 16-sided tower with this bulbous dome clad in gleaming metal, and it rises apparently some almost 50 meters above the, um, the ground. It was felt that this facade, decorative and architecturally distinguished as it was, was insufficient for gathering huge crowds at the time of Dasara. And the Maharaja ordered a competition in the 1920s to extend the palace. And oh, here's another picture showing how it looks today. You, you can just see the tower in the distance. And this is the Jaya Matanda gate through which the palace compound is reached. And this is what the palace now looks like. And it's really a product of the 1930s and maybe into the 1940s. It's a continuous expansion. And uh, um, the new design, even though I'm unclear who actually executed it, but it seems to have been a local architect, um, reproduced the domes of Henry Irwin's design with this great grandstand in the middle. And those, you've been there and you've probably seen it. You know what I'm talking about. But perhaps more architecturally fascinating and exotic, at least for me, are these interiors. This is the Kalyan Mandapa, completed in about 1910, with cast iron painted columns and arches and um, a, a cast iron glass a framework for sealing, and you'll be thrilled to learn that this was all manufactured in Glasgow at something called the McFarlane's Saracen Foundry. We haven't quite worked out how the designs got from Mysore to Glasgow and back again, but nonetheless, it, it is one of the most, I would say, imaginative and, and orientalist type interiors that we have in Mysore. And this um, great octagonal space is roofed with a dome that looks like this. Or let's say it used to look like this. Because um, of the leakage through the glass, the authorities of the palace have placed a canopy over it which protects the glass but um, inhibits the light shining through. So this is an old photograph. It doesn't look like this today, but hopefully they'll solve the problem and it will be restored. Notice the peacock feathers. Rather wonderful. Again, an Indian design, certainly not something cooked up in Glasgow. The, um, and we have these sorts of motifs that we find throughout the palace in, in cast iron. Um, a pair of yalis, we know that from Indian temple art, these fierce, um, fantastic animals guarding the Wodhya emblem with, you can see, the double-headed eagle in the middle, which is the Wodhya motif. And then we have the private um, audience hall called Amba Vilas, Again, we have cast iron columns, painted and arches, all in a sort of neo-Mughal style, a sort of orientalist, um, sometimes it's called Indo-Saracenic, which is a vague term meaning something which mingles um, Indian, um, Mughal, and European architecture. Anyhow, it is a fantastic idea of what a royal space should look like, and I think very impressive. Um, even larger is the public Darbar Hall, 
And here the columns are of masonry. They're painted as the, are the arches. And if on the left, it opens up into this enormous grandstand where more than probably 2,000 people could congregate for um, guests of the Maharaja who could congregate for the ceremonies and the, and the entertainments of the Dasara in front. Now, in the palace compound in Mysore, we have a number of temples that were built by the Maharajas for their worship. So in 1809, soon after Henry Irwin, uh, the, oh, sorry, the wooden palace was completed, um, Krishna Raja Wadya III, he built this temple, Shweta Varaha Swami Temple, and you can see it's built in a sort of traditional South Indian style with this gopura, with the tower rising over the entrance. But inside, the actual temple itself is in a neo hoysala manner. Now, I will assume that many of you have seen the Hoysala temples in and around um, Karnataka, and you will notice that they all have this star-shaped shrine with many different angles. And here, this is reproduced using actual bits of a dismantled Hoysala temple, and the bits that they didn't have, they carved to reproduce. So it's a sort of a mock neo Hoysala temple. The point being, here the Maharaja wants to glance back and incorporate the 12th and 13th century architectural traditions of this part of southern Karnataka. And this is true in other temples inside the palace compound. Here we are in the Prasanna Krishna Swami temple. It's another one uh, near, near to the temple. And here is a wonderful balustrade with a yali, typical hoysala, probably 12th or 13th century, reused here. And just look at this absolutely beautifully carved wooden um, window door, window panel, allowing light to enter into the temple. This is something which was done in the 19th century, but it's very fine. So we have this very high quality of artworks. And we even have murals. So here's one of the paintings of, of a battle, I think, between Rama and Ravana, uh, one of the Ramayana scenes found in one of the temples inside the palace compound. Now, the Mysore Palace, as it's known, or the Ambabilas, is not, of course, the only royal residence in Mysore. Um, this is the Jagan Mohan Palace. <clears throat> with a rather clumsy entrance to a marriage hall with his great gates. And this was sort of added in 1900 for an important royal marriage. But at the back, you can just see, this is the original palace that was built in 1861 by Krishna Raja Wadia III. And it's now an art museum. And it's of great importance and interest because of its upper floor. So if you go to Mysore, you must take time to visit this and go upstairs and you'll come to this painted room, this Rang Mahal, which is really a wonderful panorama of pictorial art of the 19th century, showing all of the activities and ceremonies and lives of the, the, um, the Wadia king. So it's, it's really very fascinating because on the right, we have a leaf, which is the genealogy of the Wadias. On the left here, we have the ceremonies and processions of the Dasara. And on the rear walls, we have this mysterious, well, to me anyhow, mysterious board games, rather like chess, because the Maharaja was a great gamer and he invented all sorts of games and paint, had them painted on his walls. And it's quite likely this room was his sort of club um, games room. In the 19th, uh, at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century, we then have this series of really elaborate and magnificent palaces built for the relatives of the Maharaja. This is the Jaya Lakshmi Vilas mansion that um, Ambassador uh, Lata Reddy told us about, which is one of the big projects now for the Deccan Heritage Foundation. We are going to restore the interior of, these, of this palace. The exterior you can see is in fairly good condition, but the inside is greatly dilapidated. And also the collections of folk art, especially, which are housed there. So this is our ambitious project, but you can see we've chosen this absolutely beautiful building. It was built for the elder sister of Krishna Raja Wadia IV in 1907. And some of the interiors are quite well preserved. This is a sort of um, one of the courtyards inside. And you can see here the neoclassical style, which is so noticeable there, has been abandoned for more Indian type of columns with these gilded bases and tops around a, f a fountain. Even more impressive 
is the Cheluvamba Villas Mansion, which was built for the, another sister of Krishna Raja Wadia IV in 1911. They must have had an enormous sum of money that the, <laughs> to build these colossal palaces. We can't even hardly imagine what sort of lives these sisters in their separate palaces, not together, for heaven's sake, they weren't going to share a palace. So this one is another sister, 1911, and you'll be uh, maybe delighted to learn that um, since the 1950s, it has housed something called the Central Food Technological Research Institute, the CFTRI. Now, we can only imagine what sort of technological research they do on food inside this royal palace. It doesn't matter because they look after it. And this is the point. It's quite well maintained and it's well worth visiting. The only problem is that it's not open to the public except for two days a year. I'm not sure that they advertise this much in advance, but if you're lucky enough to be in Mysore on one of those two days, do go and visit. I would love to go too, but I've not been lucky enough. Uh, perhaps the most epic of all these palaces um, built by the Maharaja is the Lalit Mahal Palace, the, which is now a hotel. It was built in 1931 for the vi visiting viceroy and the European visitors, where they could have non-vegetarian food and they could, they could dance and they could drink alcohol and do all the things that maybe in the Mysore Palace it was a little bit more difficult. But here they had this um, out of, on the edge of town palace. And you can see it has this great neoclassical dome, which looks just a little bit like St. Paul's Cathedral in London, though I'm not sure if that was that. It is nothing religious about the building, but it's a beautiful design, and the exterior, as you can see, is very well maintained, as is part of the interior. This is the grand staircase. Guests must have felt very, um, you know, welcome as they went up to the guests. I hope the guests today, they feel as welcome, but I'm not sure. I haven't stayed there for ages. But anyhow, it's beautifully designed, and this gives you an idea of the, the great royal sort of architecture. Now, in the city itself, we have these sort of Mughal-style pavilions. This is K.R. Circle. It was originally laid out in 1895 at the intersection of two of the main streets of the city. And um, in the 1950s, it was decided a statue of Krishnaraja IV um, was, um, should be added and placed in a little Mughal-style pavilion, so it's called K.R. Circle today. Less well-known is this smaller Mughal-style pavilion. This is in Kupana Park, um, a Mughal type of garden, which used to be called Nishet Bagh, rather like the, 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 the Kashmiri, um, I would say, gardens, 1913. And it's worth going into this slightly dilapidated pavilion because you will see painted glass ceilings like this. Here is Durga um, on the lion, of course, and I'm not sure that this could have been executed in Glasgow. I'm not sure how this was done. This must be a local artist. I don't think in Glasgow they knew much about South Indian iconography, but you never know. Um, and of course, there's Brindavan Gardens, the great garden project on the outskirts of the city, laid out beneath the great dam, in 1911. It was a project of one of the Diwans of Krishna Raja Wadia IV. Um, so Mirza Ismail apparently went to Kashmir and he persuaded the Maharaja that there should be a great Kashmiri style uh, garden with waterways and terraces and fountains. And the water was available because it came from the great Krishna Raja Dam there, which traps, as you know, the waters of the Kaveri. Now, the British, in their own modest way, built for themselves too. This is the government house that was built in 1805 when the British also settled in Mysore. Um, and it's a modest building, a neoclassical building. It's now a government rest house uh, for, for visiting officials, uh, which means you can't go in. And then by gazing through the doorway, you don't really want to go in because it's too bureaucratic and dilapidated. But I think it is worth probably some sort of rehabilitation, if possible. More impressive is this British ceremonial arch, just standing in the middle of, a, of, of an intersection, but it originally led to the government house. You see, it's a really sort of beautifully maintained um, arch and all these sort of vase finials and all these sort of trappings of a great classical style that was introduced into the Mysore um, city and area by the British. 
when it came to neo-Gothic architecture, the British, I think, um, were less imaginative. This is a rather uninspiring church. It's the Hardwick um, Church from 1839, probably rebuilt many times, but it gives you an idea that this Gothic um, type of architecture also came part of the um, city of Mysore, and of course you know all this from Bangalore too. More interesting architecturally is the high school, the Hardwick High School and College of 1854, and here you can see more architectural imagination with these corner wings, with these, with these sloping roofs, and this triple-storied central wing which leads into the courtyard of the school. For me, this is one of the most impressive of the classical British buildings. This is the district commissioner's office, built in 1887, which was the jubilee year of Queen Victoria's reign. And people in India got very steamed up about this and made lots of buildings for this moment. And this is one of them. Um, the neoclassical style goes into the civic architecture of the city. This is Krishna Raja Hospital, 1918, uh, era of Krishna Raja Wadia IV. And you can see it's an imposing uh, edifice with a dome rising over a sort of pediment with a, with a Greek style you can see here, central zone, quite well behaved neoclassical. But it's refreshing to see that the Indian architects and designers had to make their little uh, contribution to remind people that this is not just an imported European design. This also has an Indian element. And here we have two mermaids I don't know what they're doing on the hospital facade, but it doesn't matter. They're very charming, and we enjoy them. Uh, this, is the this is the pediment over the front facade of D. Banu Maya's school, built in 1919 by a wealthy philanthropic businessman. And it's quite appropriate that in this neoclassical design, we have the Indian goddess of knowledge, Sarasvati, strumming away at her instrument in the middle. And this neoclassical style also goes into private villas. This is one of the um, um, houses in a, in a quarter of the city known as Lakshmipuram, probably built in the 1930s and very nicely maintained by the family. So there's quite a number of these villas which seem to have been preserved in this part of the city. And such things must exist in Bangalore, but I'm not sure, you know, um, if one can see them anymore. Then we have... Indo-Saracenic. We go back to this sort of um, architecture in which elements drawn from Mughal and Rajput architecture are fused with um, European classical architecture. This is the offices of the palace administration, dates from 1921, and you can see these, these turrets with little octagonal um, lookouts and domes, and this central dome with an octagonal, um, you know, turrets around here. This is typical of the sort of clustered architecture we have in this style, which is particularly well represented in the City Corporation Office of 1921. And here you can see the domes are painted red, which echo the red colour of the domes on the, the Mysore Palace domes. A very handsome building. And these are on the streets surrounding the palace. So there's, you know... The royal city has a real presence architecturally. And this type of architecture transitions into the 1930s. Here we have the Ayurvedic College and Hospital. And here you can see the dome has become slightly modernized. And um, it's a very well-planned building for the corner of an intersection. And one of the buildings that I like particularly is this Art Deco, Mysore Junction Railway Station Tower. And I was informed the other day in Mysore that it was probably built in the 1930s. So this gives you an idea of some of the different styles. But um, it also incur we should also pay respect to this bungalow style, which you have, of course, here in uh, Bangalore as well. This is the race club from the 1930s, um, a rather austere, but, but you know, um, design with two tiers of sloping tiled roofs which is the typical feature of the bungalow style, to, to keep the water away, of course, in the wet season. Um, slightly more imaginative is the Armed Reserve Police Mounted Corps on the edge of the city of Mysore, which has, again, these, um, these bungalow-type roofs. But look at this doorway. Because it's to do with horses, they've made the entrance like a horseshoe. 
and uh, which I think is a lot of fun. And above it, we have this pyramidal tower. So this gives you an idea of the sort of um, these types of styles that are all happening in Mysore from the end of the 19th century well into the 20th. But none of these styles would prepare you for this. This is, <laughs> this is the surprise. You know about Gothic, you have it here in, in Bangalore, but you don't have anything on this scale. This is St. Philomena's Cathedral, 1933. I don't know if it's the largest Gothic structure in India, but it must be one of them. Uh, towers more than 50 meters high, and it was built at the instigation of one of the Dewans, who was a Catholic, under Krishna Raja Wadia IV in 1933. He was called T.R.A. Tumbu Chetty, some of you may have heard of him. And he managed to get a relic of St. Philomena. I won't, uh, I won't pretend to tell you who she was, but she was, uh, uh, I don't know when she became sanctified, but I've got a feeling it was late 19th or early 20th century. And he persuaded the Maharaja to help with land and a grant and build this absolutely colossal um, cathedral. I wish I knew who the French architect was, but I've not been able to find out. And my colleagues, in, in uh, Mysore are still searching through the, um, through the archives to see. So this is the sort of Mysore story of the 19th and 20th centuries architecturally. And none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for this. This is um, a, an oil panorama, a painting by a British artist of the siege of Tirangapatna in May 1799, which led to the defeat of Tipu's forces, the killing of Tipu, the taking over of the fort, and for British supremacy in South India, and also a means and a moment to restore the Wadiyas who had been sort of imprisoned by Tipu and uh, um, Haidar. And so from this moment on, um, this is when Mysore comes up architecturally. And so, unfortunately, the, the fort, it also meant the end of its career. Now, this is a model of the fort, you can see of Shirangapatna. It's housed in a museum inside the fort. There's a small museum with a very nice model. And you can see that the fort is sort of wedged into the two branches of the carvery. The carvery splits here and here. And at that point, you can see how the walls, wherever possible, follow the course of the river for protection. And these ramparts, some of them date back to the early Wadiyas, some were renovated and redone by Haidar Ali and Tipu, and others were dismantled by the British. Because it was an island, the way to get there was like this. So bridges were required to reach it. This, in fact, is a bridge that was built after the siege, but it's in a traditional way with these granite pylons. You can see these pairs of pylons holding up a stone walkway or roadway. And this one is dated from 1804, and it's known as the Wellesley Bridge, after Wellesley, who was one of the British officers at the time. The ramparts that can be seen today are a mix of pre-Tipu, Haidar, and, Tip, and uh, Tipu himself, and it's a bit difficult to work out which bits were added, modified, and improved, and strengthened by whom. But no matter, some of them are quite well preserved. You can see these angled bastions reinforcing the walls. The gates, the entranceways, are probably uh, redone by Tipu. Uh, this is the so-called Bangalore Gate. Many of you who go to Sringapatna will enter the city from, uh, through these gates, and it has a slight sort of Islamic style with these, these types of arches and the uh, plaster decoration above. Now, the chief feature inside the fort today, as in the past, is the Sri Ranganatha temple, and this is the temple that gave its name to the island. So that's a, that's, you all know that who Sri Ranganatha is, um, the reclining form of Vishnu floating on the cosmic ocean. And this gateway, this South Indian epic monumental entranceway, this dates back to the early Wadiyas, even though it was rehabilitated under the later Wadiyas. Chamaraja X, in 1888, redid the gilded, regilded the pot finials so that they were involved with maintaining the temple. The, inside the temple, we find earlier vestiges. These columns 
probably go back to the 12th and 13th century from the Hoysala period when the temple was already functioning. So it has a history much going right back to even before the Wadiyas. And this is one of the interior courts of the temple. And this is who is worshipped there. So we don't have a photograph to show you because you can't take a photograph. But this hasn't prevented a local artist doing a painting of Ranganatha on the serpent with the bronze images, the processional images of Vishnu here in front with Bu and, and uh, Lakshmi. And it's important for us to, to acknowledge that during the period of Haida and Tipu, the temple was also maintained. And here are two silver vessels that Tipu donated to Ranganatha, which are now on view in the museum in the Daria Daulat Bagh. So something just to remind ourselves how they kept the temple going at that time. Tipu's projects, of course, were mostly focused on other things like this. This is the congregational mosque as you enter the city, known as the Masjid Iala, 1787. And it's a very original design. It's not typical of mosque architecture in other parts of India. And these two immense uh, minarets really have functions as lookout towers, because this is the, just near the entrance to the fort. So you could go up and look out and survey what was happening outside the walls of the city and presumably look into the city to, to keep everything calm. So it's a sort of a strategic, if you like, with a military aspect, um, mosque of Tipu. Even impress, more impressive is the Gumbas, the tomb that um, Hai, um, Tipu built for his father, Haidar Ali, in 1782, and in which he himself was buried with full military honors by the British after they had killed him in 1799. So, and this tomb is built in a typical Deccan style. If you go to Golconda, outside Hyderabad, you will see tombs that look a lot like this, with this cubical chamber, a dome above with all these little turrets around it, and also a veranda at the ground level. So I would say it is the culmination of the Deccan Islamic architectural movement, surrounded by graves of his uh, relatives, of Tipu's relatives, and there's a little mosque in the back there. The uh, designs and, and decoration of this monument are exquisite. Here is a carved window, a jali we sometimes call it, you can see it carved out of basalt, a beautiful piece of work allowing light to enter into the chamber. And here is the tomb chamber with um, Tipu and his parents buried in, the, in their graves. And look at the walls and the, and the vaults above, all covered with the Babri, the tiger stripe motif, which as you know is a sort of typical motif of, of Tipu. So he's put his stamp on it, not only in terms of the burial of his parents, but also in terms of the decorations, his motif. And there it is. And we have this tomb, now we're on tombs, um, falling to pieces on the island, unprotected. And it's sometimes thought to be um, the, the tomb of somebody called Mir Ghulam Ali Khan, who was a trusted advisor of Tipu, but we cannot, we have no historical epigraphical evidence because the grave has disappeared and there's no writing. No matter, it is a, um, a fine example of the Golconda Deccan architectural style transported to Shrangapatna, and it won't be there for much longer unless they sort of repair it. The most, the most, the best preserved of Tipu's um, architectural projects is his summer palace known as Dalia Daulat Bagh built in 1784 in a sort of provincial mogul style in the middle of a great garden with waterways. Well, anyhow, can you imagine this filled with water and fountains? Use your imaginations. This is what it would have been like. It looks a bit dreary like this, but it must have looked very refreshing and lovely and planted and cool at the time. And when you enter this pavilion, this is what you see, this veranda around a central core. And the veranda has painted ceiling, you can see up there. And the walls of the core are covered with paintings. And there are little balconies so that people in the upper chambers can look down and see who is walking around. This is a place where Tipu 
held court where he received his visitors, impressing them with his wealth, with his, um, his various, um, um, I would say, economic connections with all the different parts of India and also with overseas through his ports on the Arabian Sea. And it was also a way of advertising the great military successes that his father had celebrated. So there's this enormous mural, as some of you will know if you've been, of the Battle of Polilur in 1780 when Haidar was employed his son, Tipu, to lead some of the troops. And here in the middle is Tipu riding a white horse and elsewhere on the mural is Haidar. And they are leading the troops into battle uh, against the British and they succeeded. They absolutely had a terrific success and they carried away the commander, William Bailey, imprisoned him in Shungapatna and he died in captivity. More about him in a minute. So this is the sort of scenes of war and triumph that we have on the west wall of the, of the, of the um, inner chamber. But on the east wall, we have a very different set of images. These are scenes of peace and diplomacy. These are all of Tipu's um, connections in terms of alliances, military alliances, economic alliances, probably family alliances. And my hunch is that all of these little scenes whether they're houses, women, mosques, palaces, they would all have been identified with labels and we would have known who all of these people were. But when the British restored these paintings, um, I think we lost these, um, these things. But at least we have, we have them, even if we can only imagine who they may have been. When it comes to the palace that Tipu used inside the fort, Oh, sorry, let's get a little further here, sorry. This is more of the decoration of the Daria Daulat Bagh. It's in a splendid Mughal Rajput style with painted ceiling, painted walls, um, wonderful plaster decoration like this of the highest quality that we have and well maintained by the archaeological survey. We have to thank, salute them for their efforts at keeping this in very good condition. But what could they do with this? This is the palace of Tipu inside the fort, and this was completely dismantled by the Brits. They may have allowed the summer palace outside the city to remain, but inside the city where Tipu really held um, court and ruled from, this they could not permit. So they dismantled it and stole all the timbers and burnt what they could. And at the very back, you may just be able to see some stumps of columns. This was probably an audience hall with great wooden columns that might have looked a bit like the audience hall we saw at the beginning of the Wodiyas, which was built soon after. Anyhow, there is a, a tradition that some of these timbers were looted by the British and carried away, and that some of them, <laughs> the interior of St. Let's see, what is it? St. Stephen's in Uti. I haven't been there, and, um, but it could be that some of these timbers are actually from Tipu's palace. So it's, a, you know, it's, I would say, unimaginative reuse of the timbers, yes. Let's see if we can move on. Okay, so we're just the last um, pictures. Um, the funerary monuments of, um, of Shurangapatna, with such epic events, tragic for, the, for Tipu and Haida, successful for the British, and in a way, advantageous for the Wadiyas because of the defeat of Tipu, they were able to reclaim the throne of Mysore and embark upon the ambitious architectural projects that we were able to show you uh, before. This is the Garrison Cemetery on Shirangapatna Island. Um, it was, it was uh, established to, for, the, for the soldiers, for many of the soldiers who were killed during the siege of 1799, and for the Europeans who continued to live in Shurangapatna up to about 1850, 1860. And they included um, an interesting group of mercenaries from Switzerland called de Meuron, who used to work for anybody who would hire them, the French, the Dutch, then eventually the, the Brits. And uh, the de Meuron family today has also helped to restore the um, garrison cemetery. And this is the rather austere obelisk that Lord Curzon erected in 1907 at the very tip of the island 
of Chirangapatna, immediately above the walls that were breached by the British. That is, where they were able to make an opening to bombard the walls, to make a sufficiently large opening where they could enter the fort, fight the uh, Tipu's troops, eventually killing um, Tipu. So to commemorate this British victory, uh, Lord Curzon had this erected with some of the names of the, of the officers um, who had participated in this campaign. And this is the memorial of William Bailey. He was the guy who was captured at the Battle of Polilur that I mentioned. He's depicted in the murals, and he's the one who died in captivity. But one of his descendants, a great-great-nephew or somebody, in 1818, decided that he deserved a proper memorial. And this is the, I think, rather charming neoclassical building that was built in his memory, and it has recently been upgraded and restored. Uh, there's been some interest in the building, and it is now um, being, it, some of the vases that fell off are now being put back on again, worth seeing just at the entrance to the Gumbas. So when you next go to, um, to that part of Shrangapatna, you should hesitate, not hesitate to see it. And when I was in Mysore giving this talk the other day, I decided that I should finish on this image. Um, this is a picture of the Lansdowne building. It, this was the premier city market of Mysuru, uh, built in 1892, uh, to the rear of the palace, just in the main road. And you can see it's a, a huge building in very poor condition. It's a major piece of architecture in an important position, and it really typifies the great designs that people could do for civic architecture. And it's now under considerable threat. So I said to the Mysorean audience, you are the people who belong to this city. You must fight for these buildings because whatever they put up in its place will not have this architectural character, this architectural quality. And to lose a major building like this, and don't listen to all those things about how it's unsuitable, going to fall down and kill you if you walk past, there will be a way of stabilizing, restoring it, and then Something behind could be brought up to date with air conditioning, glass and steel, keeping the facade. These are things that happen, of course, all the time in Europe, in architecture. We keep the facades and then we make up-to-date architecture inside. If you go to any Italian hill town, you'll see a 15th century street full of beautiful houses with air-conditioned, glass, electrical, um, I would say, facilities inside, but on the street, the character of the 15th century is kept. So in India, this is a much more difficult task, I quite understand, but this is a building that I hope everybody in this part of the world will fight for. Thank you. Thank you very much for that I think, why don't you absolutely share the mic? It's fascinating and very insightful uh, talk complete with signature Rai touches. Um, before we, we open this conversation out to our fabulous audience, I'd just like to highlight um, a unique aspect of the DHF's um, series of guidebooks, which have frankly set a very high standard and a high benchmark for the entire genre. From having seen uh, a number of the guidebooks, George, um, I find that every single title unites a number of elements with a keen eye for purpose, content, and form. Um, these include detailed research behind the expert and engaging text, specially commissioned maps and plans, Suri's fabulous photographs of many of the sites, Nidhi's gorgeous design of the entire ongoing series, and of course, Jaco's superb production values. So can you tell us about the editorial and design decisions which informed the whole series? Well, um, last night we had a talk at MAP and we were asked, you know, what, what is involved in creating a guidebook? Um, a lot of trouble, I have to say, but the first thing is to find the authors. We have, once we've settled on the topic and this guidebook um, we managed to um, benefit from an American scholar called Caleb Simmons, who specialized in history of the uh, Tipu Haida era and the history of the Wadiyas, and who we would have liked very much to have been with us tonight um, here in Bangalore and in Mysore, but he's stuck in Tucson, Arizona, 
Um, and so sadly, he can't. He's a really wonderful historian. And then we had a series of younger, highly informed architectural conservationists and, and journalists. So we have Malavika, and we have Shivendra, and we have Akila somewhere in the audience. All of these younger people who are involved in um, puzzling, worrying about the monuments, and involved in the actual restoration. So this was a wonderful team, and they provided the information. I was like a sort of a manager of putting the text into order. We have this great photographer, Surendra Kumar Suri, who's done the last half dozen of our um, uh, guidebooks. He's based in Hospet Hampi, and he's a very good architectural photographer. I hope all of you will agree when you get the guidebook that the pictures are really good. And we want people to feel that verbal, inf written information is backed up by wonderful images because then you look at the picture and say, right, I think I would like to go and see that. What is it? And then we have the designer who lays everything out in a formula that we have established and we put maps um, into the leaflet, uh, the, the jackets. We have a map of central part of Mysore showing where all the major monuments are and then we have a map of the fort and the island of Srirangapatna. So we want to treat you as people who would like to know all these things and give them to you so that you can use them. And from having used some of the books, they work wonderfully. Thank you. Yeah. We stay, well, I think we, the DHF and its team, its, its authors, its photographers, we will take that as a compliment. Thank you. I think we can open the conversation up to our audience now. I think George will be happy to take some questions. Yes. Uh, do you have any uh, plans for a similar uh, guidebook on Bangalore? We do not. <laughs> not because Bangalore isn't worth it, but in fact there, you have, there are quite a few publications on Bangalore, architecture and heritage walks. I think Bangalore's quite well served, I would say, compared to Mysore. So it was a decision. Uh, one day, let's see. Yes, so we have no, we have no, uh, no decision not to do it, but not for the moment. So, leave it to you. Yeah. Hi, George. Thanks for the session. Uh, my name is Sohil. I am from the uh, city Warangal. I hope you have heard it, um, which the Kakatiyas rule. Uh, I'm a product designer. So uh, the question would I ask? Maybe amateur, uh, based about my background. But yeah, um, I just wanted to touch upon a point which you mentioned uh, in Tipu's Summer Palace, which uh, you mentioned that the design consists of Rajput and Islamic uh, design, right? How did that uh, get into um, architecture? Like, my question is like, uh, India was, wasn't was ruled by Islamic kings before. So the design was mainly uh, based upon uh, the geographic. Later then, uh, the Islamic design was uh, introduced. Was it, um, did we see the intersection between two just because of the kings or were the architects also interested in that and then explored that um, intersection of those two? Also, my follow-up question would be, we don't see. <laughs> Sorry, once there. <laughs> okay, you've, uh, this is a big question, but I would say the image of royal palace architecture in the 18th century, the ideal palace throughout the country was which the Mughals had sort of devised. It was true in Rajasthan. It was not to do with Islamic Hindu, but the Rajputs, as you know, built in a sort of Islamic style because the northern Indian Islamic style became the Indian palace design. So when Haidar Ali and Tipu wanted to build in a royal national style, if you like, that was the architecture that they turned to, and there were plenty of people who could execute it. Wherever they had come from, they had learned that style. Meanwhile, there was the other type of architecture you saw in the timber design of the Wadia Palace, and probably the timber design of Tipu's inner city palace. There were these different traditions, but when it came to a summer palace with a great garden, waterways, pleasure, the Mughal scheme, or the scheme that came from the Mughals, was, of course, a winner. Do we know anything at all about the architects, the painters, their lives? Do you have any records of the people who helped in this whole process? I'm not the right person to ask, but we have some specialists who have um, worked with the archives in Mysore. And we do know a number of the painters, 
And we probably also know the names of some of the builders, but I don't know if Malavika and Shivendra, we have information, don't we, about some of these people? We do, we do, they're in the palace archives. Do you want to, would you like to tell us more about that? Okay. Uh, so there is a book uh, by, published by the State Archives on musicians and artists of uh, Mysore Palace. So I, I don't know if the copy is still available in print, but uh, it has been published somewhere in 97, 98. And you would probably find a copy of it at uh, the State Archives in Mysore. Um, hello, George, uh, Chandra. Uh, you know, I was just wondering if there was any evidence of Tipu's mastery of rocketry in the paintings uh, in the fort or well, anywhere I think, else. I think there's a few depictions of rockets, and of course there are these armories inside the fort I didn't mention, these places where these things were manufactured and stored, as you probably know, they're scattered through the fort, these armories, and that's part of the military dimension to the fort, where they keep, kept all their you know, ammunition. And in the, in the famous Battle of Polilus scene, there's a wonderful detail which shows the ammunition wagon of the British being struck, being bombed by Haida, and it's all in flames. And this, of course, was meant that the British couldn't continue to fight anymore. So ammunition and rockets, which, of course, they sort of perfected, was a big part of the story of their success against the British for many years. Ah, somebody up there, yes. Would you know the two dates when the CFTRI building is open to the public? Am I right that these dates change each year? Or are they fixed each year? Sorry? Sometimes they do change. Yes. And are they advertised? Yes, they They are advertised. Where are they advertised? In the newspaper. So you scan, you have to, for 365 days, you scan <laughs> the newspapers and hope to find one of those days, and then you just zip down to Mysore and see the Chelovamba Palace. I haven't seen it, sadly. Uh, so you mentioned Architectural Survey of India, which is a central government bo body, uh, which is doing these uh, refurbishments. Of, uh, so I wanted to know whether the government of Karnataka supports these uh, uh, refurbishments of buildings. I think, Malavika, which, uh, some of the buildings in Mysore are central, uh, central government, ASI, uh, and some are government. I mean, Karnataka, yes, I'm not sure. Exactly. Actually, some of, uh, most of them in Mysore are not protected under ASI. They are under state archaeology. Uh, and the temples within are under the Mizrai department. But uh, ASI monuments are more in Sri Rangpatna than in Mysore. Sri Rangapatna has some central government. And of course the palace itself. Yes, there's trust. Just a, a comment because I'm also a Mysorean. Uh, a few very interesting precincts, particularly near Jagan Mohan, the, and near the Parakala Mutt, which is the Vaishnava Mutt there. But there are these Agraharas in a few locations in Mysore, which are still in uh, let's say, preserve their character. It's a very interesting kind of a, a, a precinct structure with some of the Agraharas. I thought I'd just mention it. You're right. And there's part of the 19th century expansion of the city that the um, royal family encouraged these uh, quarters, if you like, for, you know, Brahmins and various groups. And you can still see some of them. I've, I've observed them from the road. We mention them in the text. We don't have a picture of them. We have time for maybe about two more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, actually, yes. Yes, sorry. I'm sorry, mine's not actually a question, but a, a, a comment. I uh, grew up in Mysore on the Gangotri campus, and my father started the physics department there. And uh, the, before the buildings were built, they were actually housed in the 
um, palace, the Jalashmi Vilas palace on the campus, and uh, they were in the kitchens. And so my father had this X-ray equipment trying to uh, do these sort of high precision experiments in the kitchens of the palace. And when they met Princess Leelavati and mentioned to her that, uh, you know, they were down in the kitchen, she said, well, I've never been down there. <laughs> And so uh, later they moved to the to the building that was built for them. So a short question: How do you fit in two culturally intense cities like Sri Rangapatna and Mysore into one hundred and fifty odd pages? What goes in? What's excluded? Well, with difficulty, yes. But we we felt that they they should both be included because, from a visitor's point of view, so many of you who will go there will go to both, one or the other, or together. And our job is to say, once you're there, there's more to see if you have more time. And I don't think practically we could, our foundation couldn't manage a separate guidebook for Mysore and a separate guidebook. So it was that sort of idea. And you'll have to forgive us if you think we've shortchanged parts of the city or parts of the fort. We did our best to cram it full of information. And my guess is there are probably things in those guidebooks for all of you that perhaps you haven't noticed before, the odd thing here and there, nobody has known it all. And one of my pleasures of sort of helping to manage this with my younger colleagues is to learn and to visit so many of these places that I had never seen before. So I wish you all good trips. It's only, what, two hours away now, barely? Yes. Less less, it's less than, you have no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one more. We have one more question. Oh, hello. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on my last uh, visit to Sri Rangapatnam, uh, I am here. I visited the place where T uh, Tipu is buried. And I think, if I'm not wrong, that place is protected by ASI. Where Tipu is buried. The place where Tipu and his parents are buried. The Gumbas. Gumbas. The Gumbas. I think that is uh, protected by ASI. Ah, maybe. Yeah, is that true? Yeah, it's an ASI yeah. monument. You're uh, right. But uh, my question is that when I visited there, uh, uh, like the other other uh, portions where like, the Tipu had their uh, summer palace, they were well protected or had security guard. But that place, the Goomba, it felt, uh, despite being, uh, I think, an ASI site, felt quite more like a masjid. Like, no, it's like, uh, so there was less, less security available there and people were like, it's like very well, pri private property like that of situation. So where it, why it was like this? Well, it's still a living monument in the sense that people go to pay respect to Haidar and Tipu. So it has that life that the summer palace doesn't have. And I think that's why it doesn't really feel like an ancient monument, but like a living monument. And it's part of the charm. And I think it's well looked after as far as I can see. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we heard in the introduction that you came to the Deccan 50 years ago. Uh, what brought you here? Ah. I mean, we are lucky for it. Uh, you want some biography? Yes, a little bit, yes. Personal details. <laughs> so I backpacked my way through India in an era that you've read about in novels called the 1960s. You know, so <laughs> as an Australian architecture student with no money, out of a set of circumstances, I visited Badami, which nobody, of course, you know, really knew much, but I was fascinated. And they, as most of you know who've been there, they're captivating. The most beautiful place is beautiful. When I went to London, they said I had to do something called a PhD. Well, I had no idea what a doctoral PhD was, but they said you have to have a topic and you have to work on it. So I had to select something to do, and I remembered the Badami temple. So I suggested to my supervisor, and he says, you now have to go and form a, in front of a committee. Is this boring to you? No, 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 it's actually in front of a boring committee, you know, committee, and you have to argue. Well, nobody in London, at the University of London College of School of Oriental Africa had ever heard of Badami. So I had to explain, it's an early group of temples, they are in different styles, they're close together, they're very well preserved. By studying these, I'll get experience in all these different styles of 6th, 7th and 8th century architecture, all in a one area, which means you don't travel around too much. And then the professor of Sanskrit said, if there are no inscriptions on the temples, how can you study them? And I had to say, you know, there's something called the language of architecture and art. 
That's also a language. Anyhow, I did it, yes. So that was, and it was more than 50 years ago. So. I think that's a lovely note to, to close on. Thank you, George. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being a fabulous audience, of course. There are two individuals here who are the co-authors of the latest guidebook, Malvika Murthy and Shivendra. Yeah.